are now going to move on to the last part of the session. And here we're going to briefly introduce um, a linguistic anthropology of uh, the work by Morris. And of course, his work was very um, ergocentric, ergocentric, which means that you know, he was, his intention was to um, motivate some sort of pragmatic, pragmatic uh, uh, response to uh, semantics and sy syntax and pragmatics. So that signification had a pragmaticist, pragmaticist um, uh, solution, should we say, it's pragmaticist solution. Okay, so what happens then in signification? What happens? Let's say we have um, something happening, be it a, a, a signal of some sort, or an action, or something, something happens, okay? Or somebody says something, or something, okay? Somebody moves, or somebody, a smell, or something, you know. There is some sort of um, expression, expression. And there is somebody who uh, perceives that expression, okay? They get it, they say, okay, oh, I hear that sound, or I smell that smell, or I see that road sign, or I hear that music, or something, okay? Or that pheromone, or something. And um, there, is a, there is an impression, a perception. So a sign is developed. Now, where is the sign developed? The question is, where is the sign developed? Well, it could be developed already in the um, expressor, and then, or it could be developed only in the impressor, or all along the way, or something, and then around somewhere else or something. So the sign is developed, and we call this a a linguistic anthropology of behaviorist semiotics. Okay. Why? Because it is very situated in many different ways, and if it's a language, of course, a linguistic action, then it becomes a linguistic anthropology of behaviorist semiotics because there is um, a reaction towards an action. So this becomes a linguistic anthropology of behaviorism or behaviorist semiotics or semiotics in a behaviorist way. So what did Morris seek to do then? Morris sought to uh, bridge semiotics with um, its applicability through uh, a sort of pragmatism. So there was a bridge between semiotics and the pragmatical manifestation of the sign. And then this eventuated into a whole uh, range of classifications and divisions through which Morris attempted to determine ways in which these language elements actually signify usage in all discourses and a certain reaction to these um, language elements and the discourses. So uh, let's just say for now, let us say for now that the uh, Morris's semiotic pragmatism bridges semiotics and its realization in an linguistic anthropological context. Okay, because of its diversity and very personal diversity and the ways in which we situate these uh, uh, um, language acts and signs linguistically, so it becomes a linguistic anthropology. Okay, so we could say then that Morris engineered uh, methods or understandings in a practical discourse theory. Okay, so if you look at the diagram I'm showing you now, uh, the three circles, there are three circles. Uh, there's the uh, top left, the top right, and of course the bottom, and they're overlapping. Okay, so we see the, the top circle at the left. Uh, inside it, we see syntactic signification. Uh, the top right, we see pragmatic signification, and at the bottom, we see semantic signification. And in the middle, we see the Greek symbol for sigma uh, and an S next to it. During signification, these three processes always occur. There's always syntactic signification, there's always pragmatic signification, and there's always semantic signification. And according to Morris, this is definitely true. However, there is a certain syntactic signification which is incompatible with a certain pragmatic signification and which is incompatible with a certain semantic signification. 
there are certain syntactic significations which are compatible with semantic significations but are incompatible with pragmatic significations and so forth. But there is a certain set of syntactic significations which are compatible with semantic significations and pragmatic significations for a certain significating field. And this is the field within which we have a certain discourse and we get something or a certain context or something. So uh, we call these, the set of these, the sum of these, the sigma s, which is the sum of significations that uh, relate to or uh, contribute to uh, our required context. Within this area then, a combined product of each signification becomes a process of search, comparison, negotiation, and ultimately an aggregate or coalescence of signification, and we label that as sigma s, where we employ syntactic, pragmatic, and semantic fields in a shift or reappropriation. This thesis, this thesis, this thesis, or this thesis, becomes a selection through negotiation, a creation through signification, and a location through contextualization, which all together become uh, what we call topothetic. And in this pragmatic form, it becomes an ergo topothetic, which is a kind of pragmatic positioning of all significations. If we move to the next diagram, what we see is the same thing, but now doubled, we see the um, three circles on the left and the three circles on the right. And in the middle, we have a bridge of some sort. The circles on the left are the significations uh, which occur within the, and I use this term quite loosely here, within the actor, the expressor. The circles on the right are the significations which occur within the um, observer. Now, we're going to soon refute the idea that, that signification is one way. So here we will begin to refute that and suggest that, look, signification isn't one way. It happens in the producer, it happens in the observer, but then it re-happens in the, in the producer, observer, and, you know, it's a negotiation, negotiation of sorts. The sigma s happens on the left, and it happens on the right. So it happens in the actor and it happens in the observer. And there is a negotiation during this process of signification. So hence the signification is selected by the actor and reappropriated or appropriated and reappropriated and contextualized by the observer and then reselected by the actor and then reappropriated and reselected by the observer. And this becomes then another sigma s, the sigma s of the negotiator transfer and this becomes a new ergo topothetic. If we go to the next diagram, and the, it's actually quite simple when we break it down, we'll see that it's really um, an extension of the last two diagrams. At the top, we have the actor who is expressing and the observer who is receiving, but also returning and negotiating with the actor. So we have our sigma s, which becomes an interpretation of the linguistic speech act by the actor and its negotiation between the actor and the observer and the environment. And this then um, emerges into a set of significations that altogether become another sigma s. The sigma s becomes contextually placed through interpretation by the interpretant and the interpreter. And hence, we have a certain mental or cognitive appropriation. And this um, allows for a cognitive emergence of the object. This cognitive emergence guides the formation of the new object in Persian terms. And this then becomes a new interpretant or signified or new object for in Persian terms. Following this, the observer, who was the observer, who has now developed some sort of cognition, situated cognition, becomes an actor in some other way for other people or an internal action or something. And the process then re, uh, restarts and we have the process once more from the beginning. And I use the term beginning very loosely here. And we call this a continuous process of ergo topothetic. So pragmatic, pragmatic positioning of the sign. 
So we will say then that all linguistic signs are actions and are processes. So there is no linguistic sign which is not an action and not a process. The second a sign becomes, um, becomes uh, identified and signified and interpreted and there is an interpretant and interpretation, then by definition this interpretation is a reaction. So a reaction represents some sort of pragmatic effort. So any signification is a process, not a stasis. Okay, it's not a stationary object, it is actually a dynamic uh, movement from the ground to a semantic object to an interpretant. So the sign emerges as a process, not as a status. So signs are emergent. There is an emergence. This suggests that the sign is constantly and always, always and constantly in a state of emergence. So then what is the act of topothetasy? The, ta the act of topothetasy, as we described, or as we presented, is an act of semantically, pragmatically, and syntactically positioning a linguistic item continuously. So the three different classifications, semantics, pragmatics, and syntax. So positioning this item continuously. The intent and subsequent effort to position this hence becomes, it becomes and mediates a pragmatics of anthropology in language. Here the participant emerges as, as what? As an interpreter of linguistic action and more so as a continuous, continuous reappropriator of the linguistic action and this occurs through the infinite sequence of semiotic and significatory interpretations and micro and to employ a, a Vygotskyan term, which is very pertinent here, micro and macrogenetic scaffolds that become clearly a semiosis of ergotopothetesis and a semiosis of um, a process that is central to linguistic anthropology through its situated placement uh, throughout the whole process of signification. Okay, so we will now uh, finish this session and we will continue our next session next time on Emil Benvenist, who is a very important uh, semiotician. And I think that last time I uh, accidentally told you that this session would be Emil Benvenist, but I Erd, I apologize. Uh, this was uh, a session on Charles Morris and we continue next time.